Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. It's only a kick. A jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and welcome to another episode of Stat Me Up for Anfield Index, ladies and gentlemen. The international break is set to come to an end. Hopefully you've enjoyed yours. Hopefully you're looking forward to a bit of an Easter weekend. Hopefully most of you have got four days off. And maybe, the biggest thing, hopefully the Reds are about to take three points against Brighton at Anfield on Sunday. And to chat through that game, to chat through a few stats, to talk through the international break and many things off the field, I've got the normal man with me, Ben Boxack. Ben, how are we? Yeah, all good. How about yourself? Yeah, good, mate. Looking forward to the sort of Easter weekend. It's been a nice little break in a way, hasn't it, the internationals? And it should be a nice Easter break. But that all depends on what the Reds serve up on Sunday, ultimately, and what news we get around certain things. But first thing, I'll I'll rewind you a little bit to what's just happened, because I know I've seen you tweet quite a bit, and I've had my reply tweets to you. I'm sure you've noticed as well around the international break. And the highlights there. So I know you've been tweeting quite a bit around the international break and who's been doing what, red-wise for their country. What would you say stats-wise? What have been the biggest things from the international break for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of Liverpool fans, you know, we get nervous around this time. And a part of me, me, a part of me is, feels that way as well. But a part of me also just loves sort of international football, which might be weird, but I, I do enjoy it. I think it's the only aspect of football where we don't really have the money, the, the you know, the sure. sort of, uh, like, like City's owners, clubs like City or PSG, we don't really have that aspect. And we see a lot of surprise results. I think sometimes as well, playing for your country, for players means more than it does for, for their yeah. clubs. So, there's a lot more passion involved and stuff like that. So I do enjoy it. Uh, maybe not as much as, as watching Liverpool, but I I, I, I don't mind it. Essentially, I, I like to watch international football. And I think this international football in particular was, was quite entertaining from a Liverpool perspective. I myself, I, I watched, um, I went to Wales under 21s and uh, watched Luis Kumas make his debut. Nice. Like, um, in, at Rodney Parade. Um, it's only about 10 minutes from where I live. So I thought, you know, there's an opportunity to to watch a Liverpool player make their debut for, for their country at that level. Um, why not? 
and uh, it, it worked out pretty well for Kumis. He, he scored the winning goal against Lithuania uh, after a few minutes of, of coming on as well, right in front of me as well. Um, it was a, it was a nice finish as well, and um, yeah, I thought I thought he did really well. Nice moment for him. Another debut goal to sort of put into his list this season. Yeah. Scoring at Anfield in the FA Cup for the first team. He also scored in his first start in the under-21 Premier League as well earlier in the season. So he's someone I kind of just wanted to highlight personally because I because I saw him and I yeah. he played really well. Uh, I mean, in terms of the others, like Harvey Elliott was just incredibly good. Uh, two goals, two assists in two games. Like I think he's a top goal scorer in under twenty one Euro qualifying. Mm. Uh, I don't know what more he has to do to to get into that England squad. Um, but you know, I think I know a lot of people have sort of compared that situation with Kobe Mainu being yeah. pulled up. But I think you know the reason Mainu is being picked up is because. England are so poor in that holding midfield role. They're like there's a reason why Jordan Henderson keeps being called up as well yeah. because like you know there's not that many players of of that caliber for England. Whereas yeah. I think if you look at Elliot's sort of positional rivals, okay, you can make an argument actually there's there's quite a few in the attacking midfield positions that you know probably at this moment deserve to, to be picked ahead of him, the likes of Cole Palmer, who actually didn't even get any minutes for England, which which was a surprise. Yeah. You know, stats-wise and performance-wise, you'd say at the moment Palmer's probably just a little bit ahead of Elliot. So I think, yeah, fair enough. But at the same time, like, what more does he have to do? Like, surely he's not far away from, from, from being called into the senior squad. Um, another one I thought who did really well was, was Luis Diaz. Again, you know, because of his, his his sort of knock that he picked up against Man United, I, I didn't necessarily want him to do well, but he was brilliant when he played against Spain uh, for Colombia, uh, created the most chances in that game, obviously provided the assist for, for the winning goal, uh, which sort of extended Colombia's long, long unbeaten run. Um, he also completed the most dribbles in that match. And yeah, after that, he featured in, in Colombia's 3-2 victory over Romania as well. And that has meant that Colombia is actually unbeaten in 21 matches now, which is pretty the longest uh, yeah. run in international football. So, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. And I think he got to wear the captain's armband as well at some points, which sort of makes him the sixth Liverpool player, uh, first team who's wearing their national team armband yeah. at that senior level. Um, obviously, Jaden Dans wore it at under 18 level as well. Him, Trey and Yoni, and Amaro Nalo got um, another trophy in the bag after the Carabao Cup, uh, winning the Pinatar Cup or some, something like that. The uh, big ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, a tr- every, every right. trophy counts. So uh, I, I thought they did well. Um, Kyle Kelly is probably another one to mention from the Academy. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of an unexpected international debut for St. Kitts and Nevis. But, you know, I respect anyone who's eligible to play for England yeah. and chooses a- another nationality to represent. So so fair play to him. He's, he's got an interesting profile as well, under 18 level, has uh, sort of competed in the most defensive duels per 90 out of anyone in, in the under 18 team. Uh, so he's very active defensively, plays as a holding midfielder mostly, but he's he's covered at left back and he's covered at centre backs at, at, at time this season. And I think he, he's he's an interesting one to sort of watch. Maybe someone who could potentially be involved in preseason um in, in the summer. Um Connor Bradley got a fantastic goal. Um, yeah. That was that was really special. Um he, he plays kind of in a more advanced position for his country as a almost a right winger. Uh, reminds me of Gareth Bale for, for Wales at times. Um, I think he made the comparison to, to sort of how he wants to be like Robertson for Scotland. But for me, um, I know he actually named Bale as his sort of idol growing up. So I can see the the resemblance there as well. Um, not another one to highlight. I thought Luke Chambers for, for England under 20. Yeah. Um, not a lot of people sort of mentioned him but he 
creates so he was involved in in two England under 20 goals in two matches uh, got the pre assists in in two goals against Poland and the Czech Republic um in, in the second game he only came on as a substitute and played like 12 minutes but you know he still created sort of one goal which is impressive and then in the second game he actually started against the Czech Republic and uh made 16 recoveries uh, was involved in 12 defensive duels won seven of them I think six interceptions as well which is again really impressive numbers and he's doing really well on loan at Wigan uh won their uh, month, player of the month for February nice uh, so yeah he's, he's doing really well he's definitely one to watch uh had another solid international break as well um I, I think pr- probably finally Let's give Dominic Sobosai a mention. You know, he was sort of the talisman for his country again. Um, uh, I know you said they're sort of meaningless friends. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, I guess there is some importance in preparation for the Euros. And I think for Dominic in particular, he really wants to keep that, continue that unbeaten run as captain of the national team, which has now stretched to 14 games. So since he's been appointed captain, he hasn't lost a game. And uh, in his last five games now for Hungary has five goals and three assists so not bad numbers and I think you know if, if you watch the games like he's plays a lot deeper than he does for Liverpool and, and everything seems to sort of flow through him he, he covers pretty much every position when when he's playing for Hungary and uh, it, it means a lot to him to I think to to sort of you know be the captain at such a young age and and be sort of such an iconic figure because I think a lot of people in Budapest, they go to watch the game. And the reason why the game is a, is a sellout within like an hour, every single time the Hungarian matches are released is, is probably because of him. It's, mm. it's a big factor for sure. I mean, the, the national team is doing well, but I think Sobosé is, is contributing a lot to the to the public. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a strange one. And listen, for anyone listen, I, I fully, fully respect everyone in national football. I, I you know, full respect for the people who, who get behind it, like it, proud of their nations, proud of their countries. I fully understand and, and respect that. For me, international football has just always been a bit of a, a no-no in that type of regard. And yeah, I, you're right. I mean, I tweeted back to you jokingly, as you know about Dominic Zaboslai, and half of Hungarian Twitter jumped on me. So I'll probably <laughs> owe an apology there, don't I, in that regard to, to them as well. But yeah, I suppose the one thing I always think about with the international break is, like you mentioned, no injuries, that's what you pray for. And obviously we had the Robbo situation, don't we? We're still waiting for full news on that. Suggestions is positive from a lot of journalists, but we're still awaiting a, a clear update on that. And then, yeah, like you said, Zabozlai probably wouldn't want him to play the full 90. I get rhythm tune up, as people said as well, that that plays a part. Probably the happiest bit I had of the international break was that Salah didn't go, Nunes didn't go, and then Endo had his game cancelled early, didn't he, because of issues between... Japan and Korea, apparently. So, yes, that was the thing. But we will see very shortly what impact it has on the boys and Sunday beckons. I mean, before we jump to the game stuff, Ben, off the field as well, there's quite a few things going on, as there always is. The Richard Hughes one was probably the biggest announcement of the week just gone, wasn't it? I think it was no surprise, as we mentioned before, but it was confirmed by Liverpool, people who believe he's going to start work on the 1st of June get a grip, but that's obviously up to your opinion, I suppose, there. I mean, I know you've talked about Richard Hughes before and tweeted about him, that type of thing. You're a big fan of this guy, aren't you? Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. 
Throw the best birthday party ever that your child will always talk about. Big Air Trampoline Park inside Fieldhouse USA at the Polaris Mall can do just that. Award-winning birthday party packages start at just $300, and all birthday parties include pizza, drinks, a party room with a party host, grip socks, printed invitations, and all 40 attractions at Big Air Trampoline Park. It's a birthday party you and your kids will never forget. Book your party today. Big Air Columbus, where the fun never ends. Visit BigAirUSA.com slash Columbus for details. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Yeah, I I mean, I think the fact that he is someone who knows uh, Michael Edwards so well... um, just makes sense for Liverpool. Obviously, given that Edwards is not going to be in the same position as he was last time, yeah. he needed a sporting director to work with who he, you know, he knows he can work with. He, he knows mm. they're sort of in the same tune. And I think that's certainly huge in that sense. And, you know, I know, you know, if you're looking at his chances at Bournemouth, like it, it might not be the most impressive, but he's gotten a lot of the recruitment right during his time at the club. Um, and I think at, from a sporting director's perspective, I think the most impressive sort of factor about Hughes is the the way he's been able to convince more high caliber players to come down yeah. and play for Bournemouth. So, you know, may, like, the likes of like Nathan Aki, for example, he might have, you know, he had probably had better offers and yet he decided actually I'm going to play for Bournemouth and, Works out for him. He got regular minutes, and they managed to sell him on for for a big profit. Um, I, I covered the the Benosh Kerkes transfer, yeah, you know, and uh, I I know he had uh, a lot of other interest in him, but he was sort of won over by by Hughes and the the Bournemouth group because of, of what they were offering. And uh, I think the big appeal at the time was the fact that Bournemouth managed to get Andy Arolo in. Who you know he was a another sort of high caliber manager who probably mm. has you know higher offers or, or or better offers. He did really well in La Liga, and I, I know a lot of clubs were interested in him. But he decided to come to Bournemouth, and you know through the manager as well, they they were able to appoint uh, bring in players. Sorry, who who were um, you know that that next level almost almost yeah. for Bournemouth, because at Bournemouth that's what you're always looking. To, to be, you know, making the next steps, bringing in the, the sort of next level players. And um, that's what Hughes has done really well. He, he's been able to build Bournemouth gradually. It wasn't a, an overnight success, but, yeah. you know, if you look at where he started and where they are now, it, it's been really impressive. And um, yeah, I think just on that, I, I, I like him. I like the fact that he's got the Italian connection as well. because. Jack. I, you know, I, I think the Serie A is actually probably one of the strongest leagues in the world right now, uh, for me anyway. And uh, there's a lot of exciting players in Serie A at the moment. And the fact that he speaks fluent Italian, he's he's got that Italian connection. I mean, I I I would like to see us sort of dip more into that market because when we have recently. Mohamed Salah, Alison Becker, like like we've done all right with the, with those mm-hmm. signings, and I think there's a there's a few players who you know could be on their radar from that league, and you know maybe Hughes can have that influence and and convince the scouting team to 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 look in that direction as well. Will be interesting to see, and Michael Edwards obviously likes it because not only is he bringing Richard Hughes, he's also bringing Mark Birchall by the sounds of it, their football scout. 
and the, the name escapes me, but they're head of football operations. So it's a full plundering job on Bournemouth by the looks of it. And the other stuff that's really sort of been the talk off the pitch and the names come round, as we know, Ben, about who the new head coach will be eventually. But it does seem, again, the Amarim, the Ruben Amarim talks really reverberated, started again through a lot of sources, a lot of people talking about his release clause, Liverpool being interested, that sort of whipped up again. I mean, these do seem to be the two names, don't they? Double A, Amarim, Alonso. They they are, the seems, the front runners, the names that keep getting mentioned as always happens in a pivotable race. It usually comes down to two, doesn't it? Stats-wise, because I know what we've talked before about like preferences, what we like, res- what resonates, but from a stats perspective, when we look at it that way, because that's what we do on this show, how do they stack up stats-wise? I mean, for me, I, I still think Alonso is, is the outstanding candidate. If you're you know, looking at the way he plays, um, his team has that sort of gig and pressing mentality, but at the same time, like they're really good in possession, almost Guardiola esque in, in the mm-hmm. way they move the ball about. We've spoke about, you know, how they've completed the most short passes in the Bundesliga, but at yeah. the same time, they've they also rank in first place for recoveries made in the Bundesliga, uh, tackles made in the final third of the opposition's final third. Sorry. I think they're ranking second place for that. So, you know, they rank really high for, for those pressing metrics as well. Um, on the other hand, I think Amarim, I, I like his style. It's interesting, but I don't quite see the same intensity, the same sort of game and pressing as 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 with Alonso. It, you know, for, for recoveries, they, they rank around mid-table in the Portuguese mm. league. Um Similarly, I think they're like only sixth or seventh for for uh, wow. made in the final third. So those are not really outstanding statistics when we're looking about key metrics for what we expect a Liverpool team to play like on the Jurgen Klopp. I know there's been reports that you know he takes um, the d- data wise he takes a lot of blocks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there are other metrics that we measure as well maybe that, you know, I I don't or we don't quite have access to. So sure. I'm sure, you know, there are other under, underlying data that where he does profile well. Uh, but just looking at, at those sort of figures, for me, I think Alonso on, on those alone wins it for me. And I think he's, his sort of style is is so intriguing in terms of the way um, Leverkusen keep possession, yeah, uh, which is not as it's not as prevalent in in the sporting team in our Amarim sporting teams. Um, I think what t- sort of obviously Amarim has much bigger sample size in terms of sure. he's he's been working at that top level for a few years. Um, and I saw another sort of factor that. I have question marks over Amarim is um, his performances in Europe. Um, I think he obviously got knocked out in the round of 16 in the Europa League this season. Um, I think the, the furthest he's ever gotten was the quarterfinals wow. um, in the Europa League and then the round of 16 in the Champions League. I mean, mm. in the Champions League, when he did get to that stage, it was Man City. So you're not expecting him to yeah, win. True. Yeah, true. It's, it's, it's a bit hard. Um, but like, for me, he's like, he's always got on sporting to the stage where you know, they're expected to advance, but he never got them quite out of the stage where, you know, it's the, the game's maybe 50 50 or, you know, you, you're, you're, you're expected to win or, or or you're not quite sorry you're not quite expected to win mm. uh, but you get that victory i think the closest he got was knocking out arsenal uh, uh, a couple of seasons ago in the europa yeah League. you know a lot of teams have knocked out arsenal and uh, olympia <laughs> also knocked out arsenal yeah. recently so again that's not necessarily such mm. a result and and it wasn't the arsenal team that is playing now so oh, no. You know, like um, last season when when he got to the quarterfinal, he played against Juventus, which is would have been one of those games where you know if, if 
you knock them out, that's that's really impressive. But he cu- couldn't quite do it. Um, with Alonso, I think we haven't seen that in him in Europe either. Right. Fair. I mean, he's reached the semi final of the Europa League in his first season. Um, but like the run up to that is I think he played Ferenc Varosh in like the round of 16 and mm. Union SG in, in the quarterfinals. You know, those are two teams you'd expect to win. Yeah. Again, um, this time around in the Europe League, he's the, the group was pretty straightforward for him. Uh, Quarabag was again like a team you'd expect mm. to be. And actually, in fact, they almost didn't. So, um, you know, I've, with, with Alonso, it's he doesn't have that experience yet. Yeah. Uh, with Amarim, he hasn't been able to do it. Whereas with Alonso, we just don't know. So both of them actually leave a few sort mm. of question marks in Europe. Uh, but you know, with Alonso, I'm gonna sort of give him the benefit of the doubt and and see how he does this season in, in Europe. Right. Uh sort of increase his sample size. And obviously I think he his Leverkusen team was quite unlucky not to to beat Mourinho in the semi-finals of um, last season's Europa League. So uh, we'll, we'll see how far they get. But it is just, I think, something to note because when I'm looking at prospective Liverpool managers, I'm always looking at sort of, have they been, have they managed to achieve something extraordinary? Because that's what you need to yeah. do to manage Liverpool. You need to have done something remarkable. And yes, i been, you know, the, he won the league title with Sporting for the first time, I think, in 19 years, which is very impressive. Uh, but Alonso, I think, at the moment, the way he's dominated the Bundesliga, the way he reached the semi-finals of the Europa League in his first season, yeah, it's just a little bit more impressive. And the sort of numbers as well that we have access to sort of suggest that his pressing is a bit more intense, his bit a bit more in line with what Jurgen Klopp is doing. So for me, he's, he he remains the outstanding candidate. But I, I wouldn't complain, you know, if it was Amarim. I think yeah. he's still got a lot of qualities about him that would make him a, a good fit for Liverpool. Will be interesting to see, who, and I mean this, whoever it is, what information we get released to us or through the press eventually about the search, because we've heard about it being statistical based. Will Spearman being involved, haven't we? How it's been done, what? Also, what the uh, the outstanding candidate brings, and maybe even potentially who they can get, might play a part of it as well. We will have to see. And I suppose we'll only spend a short bit of time on this, just because the only other big thing that that came off the pitch was the fixtures were announced. And in a way, thank God we're out the FA Cup because you look at that end of April, Ben. I mean, as it stands, and, and as I say this, in case people jump on it. I know it's subject to it may change if Arsenal make the next round of the Champions League and their fixtures, you know, where one may move down. But, I mean, surely it drew your attention as well, those three games in six days. The Fulham Sunday, the Merseyside Derby Wednesday, West Ham on the Saturday half 12, all away from home as well. It feels super tough. I can't really think of another way of putting it just right. I mean... Thinking back a little bit, early kickoffs, not too bad, but that feels tough, doesn't it? It does. The, I mean, I think the only kind of, we're fortunate that it is the Everton game that, that comes in between those yeah. three. At least we won't, don't, won't have to travel that much for, for that one. I mean, imagine if it was a sort of another London game or you know yeah, somewhere, somewhere else in the country. Uh, that would have increased our, our our travel even more. So the fact that you know this what this game comes technically is is being played in Liverpool. I think yeah will help, but it, it does seem very tough. Like um, Fulham away, they're a good side. Um, like it, it's not going to be easy. We've seen in no. the cup, they 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 right. were easy in the semi finals. Everton, I mean, no matter how badly Everton are doing they're always going to yeah. be a problem for Liverpool it, it's it's the derby you just never know what's going to happen especially when we're playing away um, mm. and then Atalanta it's it's the second second leg correct me if I'm wrong for I, th- 
Yeah, I think it's Atalanta, and then I think it's it's literally because it starts the twenty first. I think it's the Fulham game, and then it's those yeah. three in a row, literally. Yeah. yeah so yeah, it's, it's 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 going to be tough. Yeah. It is, and uh, yeah, West Ham to finish. They, there's a lot of teams who would love to put a dent you'd fancy in our title dream one year, but we will see how that unfolds. And moving into this week, because it's a week coming, obviously it's Easter weekend for people, but Liverpool play on Sunday and then they play on the Thursday, don't they? So it's Brighton, Sheffield United. Now, I think it's fair to say in terms of fixtures, people don't look at these two and think, oh, that's, a, you know, a lot of people I think would have even picked these, especially the Sheffield United one, I think would be the obvious one to to a certain extent, Ben. I mean, let's talk about this, first of all. Brighton, Deserby, another manager who's been linked with us, hasn't he? Maybe to a lesser extent than Alonso or Amarin, but definitely in the, the mix, shall we say. I'm not expecting a good answer when I think about this. What are we, What's our record like against Deserby, even if it's at Anfield as well? I mean, he's only played at Anfield once, and right. that was a draw, so... To be in all fairness, is it one game is this hard to, to go off of? Small but sample size, him, yeah. We've played him four times and we've never beaten him actually. So uh, right. yeah, that doesn't bode well for us. Um I think the last time we out we played them was actually before, just before an international break. So yeah. Kind of a nice sort of contrast or well, interesting contrast that now we're playing him as the first game back after an international break. That was a two or draw. I think at the time, Brighton were a lot more impressive than they have been. Yeah, before. higher up. Um, Definitely. They've had a lot of injuries since then. You know, Mitoma has caused us a lot of problems. He's out for the season, so yeah. he's really causing us problems, which is good. Um, mm. And um, overall, I think it was a game that we would have felt we should have won. I thought we dominated and... Yeah. Uh, we, kind of, we were just kind of unlucky with that one and again it, we we seem to have it a few times now with the international breaks where we go into the international break a little bit disappointed or on mm. the back of a poor result um, so yeah that was one of those where I think we, we were kind of disappointed but yeah our Anfield record in the last three games hasn't been good either uh, we've had two yeah. defeats and one defeat um, there was a three or draw. Um, then there was a two or draw. And yeah. I remember Enoch and Wepu, who, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, the one in the corner. Yeah. Top yeah, corner. He's a, yeah. He's a big, I, I, you know, I, know, I know him and I know he's a big Liverpool fan. So that meant a lot to him. And it felt weird seeing someone that you, you know, you like, you've spoken to, uh, mm. score against Liverpool. And it's kind of like, you know, you want him to do well. And you know how, much, how important that moment was. But at the same time, I was like, could have done it when we were freeing it up, you know. So yeah, like that. indeed. Yeah, importance and, wise. And then uh, there was a, a one nil defeat um, back in February of 2021. Again, we're mentioning that season again. Uh, was a bit of an anomaly. It wasn't with fans. So actually, the last time we beat Brighton at Anfield in the Premier League was in 2019. Um, wow. In November 2019, so that was the season that we won the league. Virgil van Dijk scored a brace, we won 2-1, and obviously went on to lift the Premier League title at the end of the season. So, you know, it, I don't know if it's written in the stars, but if we do get that mm -hmm. victory over Brighton, uh, I think it's interesting that the last time we were able to beat Brighton at Anfield was when we won the league, coincidentally, and obviously we're, we're fighting for that again this season. Indeed, yeah. Look at that. Four times that we've played Deserbi and not won. Yeah, back to 2019. That is, yeah, it's the uh, the banana skin potential. And I mean, we're all ex still expecting, I think it's fair to say, us to beat Brighton. Like you mentioned, the injuries they've had, the way it's gone for them. They're, they're probably struggling to navigate that Europa and the league together a little bit there at the same time. I mean... This is an interesting one this week. There doesn't seem that many weeks, Ben, where there's been two Premier League games in a week. I mean, we've, we we know we've had a weekend then moved because of, you know, a Thursday Europa game or a Carabao, something like that. But there doesn't seem to have been too many where there's been two league games like this Sunday, Thursday or whatever. 
What do the stats look like for us when it's two league games in a week? Is this do they bear well? Please tell me they bear a little bit the Deserby record. Yeah, I mean, last time out was in February uh, when we beat Brentford away from home and then Luton on the yeah. Wednesday. Uh, I think they were both 4 1, so didn't seem to cause us any problems. Uh, we, we also played Chelsea midweek a bit before that, but uh, that was like there was an FA Cup game in between. Yeah. So I, I didn't count that, but 4 1 victory midweek in a Premier League game again. Um, then before that was, I think, back in December when we drew with Arsenal um, in a game with, well, if uh, VAR was working properly, I don't yeah. know. Should have won. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we went to Burnley away and got a 2 0 victory, if I remember correctly. Um, so again, didn't seem to cause us problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if you remember that before that was um, when we beat Fulham 4 3 at Anfield and then went yeah. to Sheffield United. Um, oh, yeah, away. Yeah. Um, you know, Again, we're going to be facing Sheffield United in a midweek game, so it's twice now this season. Um, but yeah, but all, each every single time when we have played a, a midweek game after a Premier League match uh, on at the weekend, uh, we we have won. So uh, I don't think that record is going to change on Thursday against Sheffield United. I mean, I think that would be the surprise result of the season or, or the, yeah. the big shock of the season if Sheffield United even got a point against Liverpool in that game. I mean, it, it should... I mean, I'm, I'm going to touch wood here just because yeah, yeah, um, I'm a little bit cautious of, you know, jinxing it for, for us, but it would really be a huge sort of surprise if Sheffield right. got anything out of that game and I'm expecting a, a, a big win and... Yeah, I, I think, you know, fingers crossed <laughs> that, that that's how it turns out. I think so. Yeah, it sounds it's actually quite good. You for, you almost forget, don't you, like that that Brent and Luton, Brentford, sorry, Luton week, even when we had all the injuries in the Brentford game, Darwin does his audacious chip. We're, we're literally, yeah, struggling for bodies against Luton. We're 1-0 down at half time, but we go on to win it 4-1. Yeah, like you say, Fulham, Sheffield. So it actually looks quite good in a way. And... I think you made a fair point if, as well. If we would pick anyone to play in the league, it would be Sheffield United at home. I don't think there's any debate on that realistically. You look at the position, so you can have zero complaints about that fixture. But we have got two in a week coming up and we'll have to see what unfolds for the Reds, won't we, ladies and gents? And the final bit of the show that I'm going to ask Ben, and there's a bit of a caveat to this. So I'm going to ask Ben for his player of the year and young player of the year contenders, usually a a top two, a top three. But naturally, because of the focus of the show, ladies and gents, it's going to be around stats, isn't it? So it can't just be like we like style. It's going to be the hardcore numbers that we like as well. So, Ben, and I totally appreciate as I'm saying this, there's still a big part. There's the business end of the season and we hope someone makes themselves an absolute hero and, you know, all have cases, shall we say, as much as that. But, Let's go senior, first of all. The senior player of the year contenders, at least, the top three, shall we say, maximum, based on the stats that we have from this season. The delicious ice-cold taste of Dr. Pepper has a lasting effect on people. Lindsay from Sacramento said, Pro tip, 40 degrees is the perfect temperature for an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. Why is 40 degrees the perfect temperature for Dr. Pepper? We brought in Sue from Duluth, Minnesota to tell us. Oh, yeah, I know a thing or two about cold. Oh, that right there is the perfect kind of ice cold for Dr. Pepper. Mm, I'd share that with my friend Nancy. She likes Dr. Pepper, too, you know. My cold All is... right, that'll be all, Sue. Having a perfect temperature for your Dr. Pepper, it's a pepper thing. Inspired by real fan posts. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. Ha! <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super-fast streaming speed throughout that match. 
you can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, I mean, I know Salah's been a little bit injured recently, but he's got to be up there. He's producing crazy numbers in terms of goals. Yeah. But I think for me, the sort of key stat for him is the fact that he's averaging over 0.5 expected assists per 90, which, you know, if, if you look at even like peak De Bruyne, he's only managed that once in yeah. his entire career in a season. So that is just crazy numbers creatively. Salah has been brilliant. Uh, I think, you know, he's, he's won games at times single-handedly. I mean, that was mm-hmm. one game against Sparta Prague recently where he created nine chances, which is just crazy. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, goal scoring-wise, he's still the same Salah, but he's just sort of elevated his game creatively as well. And we're, we're sort of, I think, we could be seeing the best version of him yet in a Liverpool shirt. There is an argument for that anyway. Um, for that, you've got to make him a, a player of the season contender. And I mean, similarly, I don't I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone when I say Virgil van Dijk. Um, you know, defensively, he's been brilliant. Um, his aerial presence in particular, he's won 80% of his aerial duels or around that, which is the highest in Europe's top five leagues. Wow. Uh, the centre-backs... Um, I mean, everything else as well. He sort of ranks in the top five in the Premier League for in terms of defensive duels, interceptions. Um, yeah, he's he's been his usual best, really. Yeah. Uh, Numbers-wise, um, he's got to be, a, I think for me, not just for Liverpool, but he's someone I would consider for PFE player of the, the yeah. season. I, no doubt. A contender for that. Salah maybe misses out because of the injury period and, and the AFCON mm-hmm. he had I think you know maybe I know that these sort of votes can be pretty harsh so um, especially when sure. it comes to, to Liverpool players they, they don't seem to get the recognition they often deserve so maybe Salah misses out although I don't think he deserves to but Van Dijk surely certainly uh, that would be incredible if you know he doesn't make the shortlist um, third I mean you know, Darwin Nunez. Mm-hmm. I I did. I I kind of have to say him because I picked him as my player of the season or predicted player of the season at at the start of the season um, on one of these podcasts. And I think he's sort of proven me right. You know, a goal or assist every seventy nine minutes for Liverpool in all competitions. Um, and it's not just you know that he's scoring and contributing with goals regularly, but he's scoring at important times so six match winners which is the highest for Liverpool this season and they've come at really crucial periods uh, obviously the yeah. it's Nottingham Forest at that final uh, winner and you know those those kind of goals could end up if Liverpool do win the league could end up you know making sure that Liverpool do win the league so definitely but for that reason you know I, he's got to be up there he's got to be a contender and I think just if we're looking at most improved player as well, which uh, you know that that used to be an award when I was playing football on Sunday league, yeah. I I think he'd win that by a mile. But um, yeah, just in general, he's got to be a contender for player of the season as well. Yeah, well, interesting. There'll be some Alexis McAllister fans screaming at you, no doubt. But the stats, as we say, back up in terms of goals and assists there, and. The final one, and I suspect, I could, I could be wrong, I'm saying this like I, I know, but I suspect it'll be three that are in the call-ins for this. The young player of the year contenders for you, Ben? Yeah, I mean, it almost seems unfair to to include Harvey Elliott in this, but I did because, like, I, I know he technically counts as a senior player, but he's still only 20 and 
Um, you know, he's been brilliant, um, both creatively. Um, I think he ranks for, for key passes, according to Scout. He's actually averaged more than Odegaard in the Premier League this season per 90. Um, he obviously ranks uh, just below, I think, Salah and Alexander-Arnold for the metric. Um, yes. a lot of creative metrics is is just behind Alexander Arnold and Salah, so that shows you you know the standards that he is hitting. Um, I mean, on top of that, eleven goal contributions now for Liverpool. Wow. Um, he's been in great form over the last sort of um, ten games. I think he's got seven goal contributions or all close around that for Liverpool, which is pretty impressive. Uh, Twenty two in total for club and country this season. Nice. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you you can't really argue against that. He he's got to be a contender, and like we mentioned earlier on, um, it's a surprise that he's not really in contention for 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 the senior England squad because I think he deserves to be. Um, Kwanzaa, um, he's he's come on really well this season. Um, stood out for his his passing ability. I mean, most games he plays, he completes the most passes on the pitch. Um, he's in the top 10 for defensive duels in the Premier League and he's one of the few centre-backs in the Premier League and I know it's a small sample size but yeah, he averages six aerial duels per 90 and out of those few centre-backs who average such a high volume he actually wins the has the sort of best success rate with over 65% so um, again based on those numbers you, you, you can't really argue against yeah. it um, and lastly, I mean, I went for Connor Bradley. I think um, no surprise, really. I know he's only really started to play for Liverpool in 2024 in, in the second half of the season. But mm. even so, like just looking around Europe's top five leagues, he is averaging the most goal contributions in, in all competitions from under 23 fullbacks in Europe's top five leagues. It's, I think, just around zero point. 35 per 90 or something like that which is really impressive and you know those under 23 fullbacks includes Alfonso Davis, Ryan Knight Nuri like there's a lot of quality big names big value players involved and and Bradley is um, not only averaging more goal contributions per 90 but he actually has more goal contributions in total as well but for example Davis I think only has four, whereas Bradley already has seven this season for, for Liverpool. And uh, actually in the calendar year for 2024, no one has more um, sort of goal, co- total goal contributions in all competitions from Europe's top five leagues out of fullbacks than Bradley. So uh, he's had a, a pretty good year so far and obviously topped that off with his first international goal at senior level. So yeah, I think the sky's the limit for him and uh, he, he's got to be a contender, although I think maybe any other season he, he would have won it. Uh, yeah. Onza might have won it, but um, if we're being fair, if we are, you know, basing it on on age, not on experience, it, it's it's got to be Elliot. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? You're right. Probably all three in many seasons that Liverpool have had, they'd have been the clear winner by a mile. In fact, in... In other seasons we've had, probably the likes of Bobby Clark would have had a shot as well and people like that who've also done well. But exactly as you said, these three youngsters, they've been pretty special this season. Elliot, Kwanzaa and Bradley have been unbelievable. And with that in mind, ladies and gents, we might need them on Sunday. Who knows? But all it really leads me to ask Ben is the very final question. Ben, it all starts back up. The business end, really, as people say, 10 games to go. This isn't a factual stat. This is a guess a little bit. But if you had to put money on Sunday, what are you going for? I'm I'm going for a 2 0 win. I think I think we'll get it. I think we we'll finally get one over De Zerbi. Uh, you know, he hasn't necessarily experienced Anfield at, at its peak, I think. Um, and I think on Sunday we've been starved off, you know, no games for two weeks disappointing result against Man United. I think Anfield's going to be absolutely buzzing. Um, I think, you know, we've managed to escape the international week relatively. Yeah. Uh, in terms of injuries, 
I, the two key players for me stayed behind as well in, in Salah and Nunez. So they would have had a rest. They'll be eager to get going and get playing again. So yeah, I think everything points towards us us getting a, a solid win and building on for Sheffield United. But more importantly, that revenge against United next weekend because that, that's the big one for me. That That could decide the title and I really want to beat them. <laughs> Yeah, I can well imagine. April the 7th, Super Sunday. I think most people put that firmly marked in their calendar if they didn't already after that FA Cup defeat. And we will see, ladies and gents, next time we're back, we'll be talking about naturally how we went against Brighton. We'll see if anything else develops. Looking a bit ahead to Sheffield United, hoping we have positive news on the injury front as well from Jurgen Klopp's press conference. So all it leads me to say as ever is, Ben, Thanks for the time. Thanks for the stats and thanks for the insight, my mate. Yeah, a pleasure. And like I said, fingers crossed for for some good results this week. Yeah, indeed. It all starts again, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? And that was another Stat Me Up for Anfield Index. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement. And we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, We'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.